the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Get down on my knees and pray. Let's go to the word of the Lord today and uh, let's get God's word. Would you help me please? Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and our lives today. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice, be glad in it. Father, we thank you for our hearts that you are touching right now. We want to be filled with your ways and your word. We haven't come into this house to hear from a man. We haven't come into this house to hear from a woman. We have come into this house to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us. Encourage us, guide us, guard us. Direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and give you the glory and give you the honor. Father, we would ask that you bless us, but not only us, all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodist Episcopalian Charismatics Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center. Thank you for the Assemblies of God, Foursquare Denomination, Trinity, Emmanuel, Ecclesia Church, Lord. We thank you for our Adventist brothers and sisters and Catholic brothers and sisters. At no time, Lord, do we think of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's but yours. May all the praise and glory go to you. Thank you for your wisdom as you have designed churches that meets the needs of every person out there. You're greater and smarter than any of us. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you all the glory and all the honor. Jesus, mighty name with a great big shout, we all say amen. Amen. Go ahead and take your seat, get your Bible, you know where to go. We're going to Hebrews, the third chapter. We've been at this for a couple of years. We go line upon line, precept upon precept. You know, the neat thing about going line upon line, precept upon precept, is you don't jump around and just hear what the favorite message is of a pastor. you got to go to all of it. We go to much as we can, and we still just scratch the surface. There's so much in the word of the Lord. Before I give you a title of today's message, I want to talk to you about something, and I want your attention. We're going to share about one word today. If you take this word and understand it, how it applies in your life, one word, it'll change your entire future, it'll change your focus, it'll change your direction, it'll change everything about you. One word. You can understand one word. Today is your day to understand this particular word. God makes a statement. That if you understand this particular statement that God's making, it changes everything you think about yourself. Did you know that you're under attack all the time? There's people coming at you telling you you can't make it, telling you you won't make it. There's a whole world of negativity out there that says you're no good, you're a loser, you're a big failure, you're not smart enough, you're not cute enough, you stink, you're no good. Half of those are from your friends, the other half are from your relatives. But I found out also the worst enemy of all of us in here is ourselves. We don't think much of ourselves. We've sized each other up. We've sized ourselves up. We've checked ourselves in the mirror from every direction. We don't like what we see. We don't think much of ourselves at all. But unless you change your perspective on who you are, you will never go into your own personal promised land that God has for you. Let me explain what I mean. God has a personal promised land for each and every one of us. God has given you gifts and talents that you may not even know you have. God wants to use you in a mighty way like you have never been used before. There's a future, there's a destiny that'll change the world that you're in and the world around you. Satanic principles and negativity of this world will do something. Try to stop you from being what God has for you. And if you live in that realm of believing what people say, 
relatives say or even what you say about yourself, you will never go into your personal promised land. God has got to get something on the inside of you, a better picture of who you really are, not based on what you think or what people say, but it's based on what God says and what God's done in your life. Jesus said it like this, I have come to give you life and give it, I'll finish it more abundantly. He didn't just say, I've come to bring you to heaven, get you saved and take you to heaven, but I have come to give you life and give it more abundantly. Most people don't know how to operate within that abundant system that God has set in your life. And I'm not talking about material things. I'm not talking about money, so don't think about that. I'm talking about living a life to the fullness that God has planned and paid for for you and me. Each and every one of us have got to come to a place where we envision who we really are in Christ Jesus. If you do not see who you really are in Christ Jesus, when all the negativity from wherever source it's coming comes against you, you will bow your knee to that and you will never accomplish what God has for you. You will never go to where you need to go. You'll never be what you need to be. You'll never say what you never needed to, to say. You will never do anything and fulfill the plan that God has for your life. And for every one of us in here, oftentimes what we've got to do is start seeing our lives based on what Jesus says and based on what Jesus did instead of what we look like or what we think or how smart or talented or gifted we are. And that's why this one word is an amazing word. The title of this message is a great little title. It's called uh, Being a Partaker with Christ. When you're a partaker, it means you share. When you're a partaker, it means you're a partner with. That doesn't mean you're on the outside. It really means, listen to this, you're on the inside with Christ. That is an amazing concept in itself. Did you know that most people that attend American churches are people who see God up there and them down here by themselves instead of seeing themselves as people who share and are partnered up with God himself? What a difference that makes. If you will, let's take a look at the word of God. Hebrews, the third chapter, verse number 14. In verse number 14, it says, For we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. We've already really talked about this subject a few weeks ago. What happens if we don't hold our confidence steadfast to the end? We went through all of that. And I'm not going to review that with you today. But I want you to know the biggest little word in the Bible is the word if. The word if means you can or you can't. And I'm here to remind you that God would never ask you to do something you couldn't do. God knows you can do this or he wouldn't have put the word if in there. But he makes this statement, for we have, past tense, become partakers of Christ. Now here's an interesting word that I want to zero in on today is the word partakers. If you are a partaker, you want to be a partaker, one who shares, one who's in partnership with Christ about something that's good, not bad. If you're going to go out, rob a bank, and then claim that I was with you, I do not want to be a partaker in some sin. I do not want to be a partaker of something bad. But if something good's taking place, and I am a partaker of it, it gives me reason to shout, and it gives me health in my life. And then all of a sudden, I start to live my life with confidence, steadfast, to the end. My job is not just to introduce you to Jesus. My job is not just to glorify and build up Jesus even though he's great and wonderful and marvelous and we could spend all of our time on just how wonderful Jesus is. Most churches do that. But my job is to get you to the place where you are confident, steadfast to the end, no matter what comes at you, no matter what trash is thrown at you, no matter what people say, no matter how things go, no matter how bad it looks, no matter what your checking account, savings account, boss, no matter what the economy, whether the Republicans are in or the Democrats are in or pedestrians are in, don't give a flip who's in the White House, Jesus is on the throne. And if I can get you there, then whatever comes against you, let me I say this to you, you will not back off. And when the eastern sky splits and he comes for us, he will look at you and look at me and say, well done, good and faithful servant. 
but I've got to get you steadfast, confident to the end. And the way to do that today is the word partaker. If I was to ask each one of you individually, let's be honest with each other. What does the word partaker really mean? You would say partner. You would say one who shares in. And then I said, what is it that you're a partner of? What is it that you share in? Your answer to me would be in Christ because it says that. But you have no idea what else you are really a partaker of and one who shares with. And when you know who that is that you are partaking with and know who you are in Christ Jesus, it helps you to have confidence steadfast to the end. Are you following me? So the verse now explodes with a giant question. What does he mean by partaker? What does it really mean to me? Because I have a lot of trash coming at me all day long, all night long, from all sources, from people who call themselves friends, people who are my relatives. My own mind throws trash upon me on a constant basis. I never feel good enough. I never feel worthy enough. I never feel as if I'm uh, able to do this. I certainly am not gifted enough. I'm certainly not talented enough. How could God ever use me? I can understand how God could use them or God could use that person, but God could never use me. And guess what? Most people feel that way. That's why they're never used by God. But when you understand that you that are born of the Spirit of God are a partaker of something, It changes your confidence level so that you can go to your own personal promised land that God has for you. And the children of Israel are the illustration that we're using here in the third chapter of Hebrews. They didn't get to the promised land because they didn't believe God. They listened to all the negativity that was around them and coming at them, and they saw the problem bigger than their God. And you and I can see the problem that becomes bigger than our God and never get to our own personal promised land. And God wants us to have confidence in him that he will take us to that personal promised land because we see God a whole lot bigger than anything that comes, stands in our way. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. Five quick things this morning that I'm going to give to you that are in the scriptures that you are partakers of the, number one, partakers of the Holy Spirit. You have God living on the inside of you. God's not just in the heavens. God's not just on his throne looking down, hoping that you're going to do well, ready to hit you in the head when you do wrong with a two by four. That's not what this is about. If you're born of the Spirit of God, you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. What in the world does that mean? Jesus said, I've got to go, that the Spirit, the Comforter, the one who will help you come, you need him. Yeah. You and I need the Holy Spirit every day. You need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. You need the talent of the Holy Spirit. You need the gifting of the Holy Spirit. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit to work and open doors that no man can open and close doors that no man can close. You and I have got to stop seeing that the Holy Spirit is somewhere else and realize the Bible says that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. In other words, may I put it in terms that are San Bernardino, you are wall-to-wall -wall Holy Spirit. And you can use and call upon the Spirit of God every day to confront whatever problems that might come your way. I don't know about you, but if you're saved, according to 1 John, the Bible says he that is truly of God does not sin. It really doesn't mean he never screws up or makes bad decisions or enters into sin. It really says it like this. He that is born of the Spirit of God doesn't continue to sin. The reason you can't continue to sin is because you have the Holy Spirit inside of you who checks you all the time. You feel miserable when you are in sin. Has anybody in here ever done something wrong and afterwards you said to yourself, wow, that was really wrong? Five of you. The rest of you are liars. After church, we'll pray they'll cast the devil out of you for lying in church. You know it as soon as it's being said. It's something that quickens on the inside. That's the Spirit of God. 
It's the very Holy Spirit that proves that we are saved if you've got the Spirit of God. May I say this to you? If you come into the house of God, a church like this, and you are falling asleep and you just don't get the Word of God, let me say it again. If you come into a church service like this and you are falling asleep and you just don't get the word of God, can I tell you something? I doubt whether or not you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you that's stirring you up so that you do get it. You may have it in mentally, but you can't have the Spirit of God mentally. The Spirit of God comes on the inside and changes you from the inside out. So hang around and we'll get you right with God before you leave this place today because you need the Spirit of God to help you get going with God. Are you following me at all? Yes. Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verse number four. I won't go to these verses that are all around it explaining what it means. I'm going to get to the sixth chapter, verse number four. Sometime in your lifetime, <laughs> if God tarries... <laughs> But it says this in verse number four, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened to have taste of the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. When you're saved, you become a partaker. Everybody say partaker of the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. Don't let anybody tell you don't. You just need to call upon him, trust him. You need to believe in him. You know, you know he's there. And when stuff comes at you, you need to rely on the Holy Spirit. He is your comforter according to Jesus. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. amen. Second thing, we're talking about you are partaker of number two, the grace of God. Grace is God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. It's the power of God to do what the word of God requests of you. Grace, God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you cannot do it. Listen to what it says again. In other words, you put in the natural, God puts in the super, now you got a supernatural result. But you got to put in the natural in order for the super to get going on it. That's the grace of God. But in order for you to have a supernatural result, grace is when you put in everything you know how to put in, you're believing God, you're strong, you're keeping going with God, then God puts in what he knows how to put in and it gets the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. So when you can't do it, you need to put your trust in the grace of God because you have the grace of God. Why do you have the grace of God? Because you're a partaker of Christ. You don't have to look for the grace of God. You don't have to hope for the grace of God. The Bible says the grace of God is yours. You're a partaker. You're a partner with God. You can call upon God. God, I've done what I know to do. I've, I've been what I know to be. I've said what I know to say. I don't know how to go any further. I don't know how to make things happen. I've done all I know how to do. But God, I'm looking for your grace now to take me where I need to be. And the second thing we're learning not only is number one, the Holy Spirit, number two is grace, but let me give you a verse on that. In Philippians 1, 7 is Paul ta uh, what Paul describes as he thinks about the people. In, 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 in Philippians 1, 7 it says, just as it is right for me to think this of y'all, because I have you in my heart, Inasmuch as both of us in chains are in defense of the, uh, the confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. You have and you are a person that has grace available to you. You need to call on God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done. If you're going to try it on your own, you're only going to go so far you need to hear me say that again. I'm saying that for somebody. If you're going to try it on your own, you're only going to go so far and God will back off and let you do it on your own because you think you got it all together. But when you try it on your own, knowing the grace of God will make up the difference, now God gets involved. Somebody ought to say amen. Third thing that we're learning about this word partake and it's so important is that you are partakers of the glory. When you see the word glory in your Bible, circle it in your Bible. And right alongside of it, the words, God's manifested goodness. We have a concept in the American church 
that the glory of God is some illumination, some exaltation, something that's glittery or shiny. You want something that's glittery and shiny? Go find Tinkerbell at Disneyland. I'm here to tell you the glory of God is when his goodness is manifested. The goodness of God manifested. When he manifests his goodness, that is the glory of God on display. You and I give glory to God by through our lives manifesting his goodness. That's giving glory to God. You have this glory. The manifestation of his goodness in your life is to go through your life. You are the West Coast distributors of God's goodness or the West Coast distributors of the glory of God. Why? Because you are a partaker with Christ Jesus. Notice what it says as Peter writes in 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, verse number five, it says to the elders, he writes these words, the elders who are among you, I exhort or encourage. I whom am a fellow elder and witness of the suffering of Christ, that also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. The goodness of God was obviously displayed in the life of Peter to this day, for thousands of years, the goodness of God has been revealed to each and every one of us. God's goodness, when it manifests in your home, when it manifests in your job, when it manifests on your life, God's goodness manifesting with your children, when God's goodness manifests itself in your finances, when God's goodness manifests itself in your healing, in your physical body. Well, I want you to know something. That's the glory of God doing the work of which you are a partner of. Three things we've learned today. You are a partner, one who shares in. You are one who is a partaker of. Number one, the Holy Spirit. You need to treat the Holy Spirit not like he's off in the distance, but lives on the inside of you. Number two, you are a partaker of the grace of God. You are a partner also, number three, of the goodness of God, and it wants to manifest in your life in every area of your life. Number four, here's what we're talking about. You are a partaker of the divine nature. I want you to hear what I just said because it's so bizarre you may not understand this. I'll make it clear for you. You have a human nature. You will do what you do because of your human nature. God takes you out of this natural human acting ability that you have and puts you into a godly nature. You had a human family. You now take on a godly family. You had human DNA. Now you're taking on a godly DNA. You no longer are left where you're at. God gives you through his promises a divine nature. Are you following me? A pig, you can clean up a pig all you want. You can scrub his little toenails. You can clean out his ears. You can brush his teeth. You can wash his body. And you can let that pig go in your backyard. And if there's a mud hole, he'll run right back to the mud hole. You know why he runs back to the mud hole? Because he's a what? A pig. Pigs will run back to the mud hole. Until you change the nature of the pig, it will always run back to the mud hole. God changed your nature so you don't have to run back to the mud hole. You used to be a person that was under the control of the flesh. You used to be a person that was under control of the world. You used to be a person who did things because your mama did it or your dad did it or because your relatives do it. It's just the way it is in my family. It's what's in my family. But God gives you a new nature. And a new nature means you don't have to run back to the mud hole, man. You can stay cleaned up in the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to run back to sin. You don't have to bow your knee to sin. You don't have to be controlled by the garbage of the world. You don't have to 
be a failure in the flesh, you can now run forward to the things of God. Why? Because you now have a new and partaker of a divine nature. You're now king's kids where before you were losers, before you were failure, before you were down and out, before you had no victory, before you had no future, before you had no hope, but sin had you and controlled you. But today you have a divine nature and you don't have to live like that any longer. You're a king's kid. The word of God comes along in 2 Peter, the first chapter. Peter writes this in the fourth verse. The first chapter, fourth verse of 2 Peter says, by which having been given to us exceeding great and precious promises. Don't you know God's promises are great and precious. That through these great and precious promises, you might be a partaker of the divine nature. Watch this. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. In other words, you don't have to be a participant of the old nature. You got a new nature. Exercise it, my friends. If you don't exercise it, it won't work on your behalf. You're a partaker. Why would you go back to the old nature when you have a new nature. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. Number five, we're talking about you are partakers of, and this is my favorite one, you're a partaker of the inheritance. Did you know you were broke down, busted, and disgusted as we say it here at The Rock? Did you know that you had nothing? I don't know about you, but no one has ever left me anything when my father died. He didn't leave me anything when my grandmother, who was my father's grandmother, died. Didn't leave me anything. In fact, she left me 100 bucks in those days, 250 years ago. That was a lot of money. But I thank God. Guess what, my friends? I've got an inheritance in Christ Jesus. You ought to write this down. You ought to read it throughout the week because it'll help you. Listen to this. In Romans, the 8th chapter, verse number 17 and verse number 18, it said, if you are of God, then you're an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Do you know what I just said? That means everything Jesus is going to get, you're going to get. Everything is being brought back to him. He created all things. It's all being accumulated, brought back to him. It's all going to be presented to him. And guess what? May I say this to you? Everything Jesus is going to get, you're going to get. Why? Because you're an heir and a joint heir. You have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Somebody ought to say amen. The Bible makes it very clear. As we look at the word of the Lord in Colossians 1.12, it says, giving thanks to the Father. Colossians 1.12, giving thanks to the Father. Why would we give him thanks? Who has qualified us? You say, I'm not qualified. Of course you're not. Jesus qualified you. You didn't qualify yourself. Jesus qualified you. Who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints? In the light, man, where you never had anything, you got a future. Where you never had a hope or tomorrow, you got it with Jesus. I want you to know something. You are the richest commodity on the planet. The highest price that was ever paid for anything on the planet was the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't pay for you with diamonds, gold, silver, pearls. He didn't pay for you with anything except his life. Your price that was set for you, the price was Jesus Christ, determines your value. You are the most valuable commodity on the planet, and you are an heir and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. When the world says you're a loser, when the people say you're going to fail, when the people say you can't make it, when you think to yourself that you're nothing but a, a failure of every sort, and you're not smart, you're not dumb, you're not pretty enough, you're not intelligent enough, you're not gifted enough, I want you to know something. You're a king's kid and the inheritance of God belongs to you. You ought to give the Lord a great big shout. Woo! My goodness, my friends, today, number one, you're a partner. You're a sharer, partaker of the Holy Spirit. A partaker, number two, of his grace a partaker of his glory, a partaker of his divine nature, a partaker of his inheritance. What more 
could God give you to get out of the who you are pity party and get into who God made you understanding of truth. Let's go back to Hebrews now, the third chapter. Now the verse starts to make some amazing sense. Hebrews, third chapter, verse number 14 says these words. For we have become... <laughs> Let's try it again. We have become... All of a sudden now, you're not a loser, a failure. You're not just somebody out there by yourself. You're not just a, somebody who has no value, has no future, has no worth, like you thought of yourself. But now you're somebody who's a partaker of Christ. When you understand that, you will hold the beginning of your confidence steadfast to the end. And that's what the verse is saying. If God spoke to you today, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. You hear that? Isn't God good? Here we've come into the house of God. We worship the Lord. We had a great time. Can I just compliment all of you just for a moment? I want to thank you. You were so good in hearing and listening to the word of the Lord. You were great today. But can I tell you something? That won't get you to heaven. Can I tell you that someone needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You don't get to heaven because you came to this church. You don't go to go to heaven because you're a nice person. You don't get to go to heaven because you're good. You don't get to go to heaven because your mom and dad said you were a Christian when you were a kid, took you to catechism class or Sunday school, or Sabbath school class. You go to heaven because you Get there God's way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. That's what Jesus said. You can't make it any other way. You can't make it my way, your way. You can't make it to heaven some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get to heaven God's way. Everything we talked about today doesn't work unless you're right with God. And so today is your day to get right with God. God brought you here. This is a divine appointment with God that you have. You've had a lot of appointments in your life with doctors and attorneys and painters and plumbers. But I'm here to tell you today you have a divine appointment with God. Today God brought you here for a reason. Today is your day of salvation. You say, Pastor Jim, I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I want to someday when I die, I want to go on to heaven. I want to open my eyes in heaven. I don't want to go to hell. Then you better listen to what I'm going to say to you. Jesus tells us exactly in the scripture how to get to heaven. Exactly. John, the third chapter, he makes this statement. You must be born again. A lot of people that attend American churches today don't understand what born again means. I'm going to tell you what it means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. If Jesus made that statement, you must be born again, then what in the world does it mean? Here's what it means. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always has been. It always will be. All or nothing. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus himself is speaking. He said, I'm coming again, and when I come, you know he is, I better find you hot, or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just really said? People that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all and are going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, honor you enough, tell you the truth. What's lukewarm? Little in, little out. Little up, little down. 
What's lukewarm? Token prayer, occasional church attendance. What's lukewarm? You're not against God. Watch this. But you're not wholehearted for God. What's lukewarm? God is something in your life. Oh, something. But he's not everything. He's just something. Let me tell you something, that's lukewarm and you're not going to make it and somebody needs to love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Today, here we are in this safe, friendly place. We've laughed, we've shouted, we've heard the word, we've sung songs. Today, you can get right with God right here in a friendly place. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do it? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, Jesus said, if you... Confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. I'm a man. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three. Bang! When I pop my hands together, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life, be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. And I'll see your hand go up. Is that okay? He said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see it. Then you put your hand right back down. It's as simple as that, right where you're seated, of giving God all of your heart, giving God all of your life. Then at that time, when you give God all your heart and life, you're born again, now you become a partaker, partaker of the Holy Spirit, partaker of the grace, partaker of the glory which you need, partaker of that new nature that you need to have so you don't have to keep operating in the old nature, a partaker of the inheritance of Jesus. You have now value beyond that which man can even conceive of. All because you gave your heart and life to Jesus. Today is your day of salvation. In a moment, when you hear me pop my hands together, bang, who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, make sure I'm speaking to you. Maybe you prayed with Billy Graham on television. Maybe you prayed at a Harvest Crusade, but did you follow the prayer up with all of your heart and life? Because there's no magical abracadabra words that you repeat. Call to prayer that'll get you in heaven. Don't treat God like he's dumb. Oh, I heard them say the right little formula of words. I guess they're going to come to heaven. I don't think so. God watches your heart that follows your life to see whether or not you meant it. And today is your day of salvation. All across this auditorium, I'm counting to three, pop my hands together. You say, Pastor, you want me to raise my hand? I'll be embarrassed if I raise my hand. Yep, 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 yep. You might be embarrassed. Get over it. It's better to be embarrassed for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever. Today is your day. All across the auditorium, back in the auditorium, in the foyer, in the family rooms, down there at the Love Rock Cafe. If you're watching by television, get ready to pop your hand up right where you're at. Who cares what people think? Are you listening to me? Today is your day. And then tell one of the ushers. Ask somebody where it's an usher. Tell one of the ushers, and they'll get you some free information. All across this auditorium. Are you ready? Here it is. One. Two, three, let me see your hands, let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, thank you, 17, thank you, thank you. There's 18 back over here, back on this side over here. There's 19, thank you. Anybody in this side, what? I know, no, no, everybody's all, all cool in this section. I don't think so. All right, so that back up on top over there. There's another one, 19, 20. Back over here, there's 20, 21. Thank you, God bless you. Put your hands out, 22, 23. Thank you, God bless you. 24, God bless you. Anybody else, real quick, there's 25. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else, real quick in the family rooms? Anybody else? on this far side? They're all pointing over this way. There's, oh, there's 24. Oh, thank you, there's 25, 26. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's another one back here. Thank you. God bless you. 27. Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 27 wise people. Here's what we want to do. 
I don't want anybody to leave. I want all 27 of you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend. You said you're going to give God all of your heart. You said you're serious about God. If you are, I want you to get out of your seat. Bring a friend if you need to bring a friend. Get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. All across this auditorium. Family room, bring your kids. Hurry, ushers, help them if you would. Help them to get out of the family rooms. They come from the foyer. Tell an usher. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. If you're serious about God, you get down here. Come on, come, come on, come on, come on. Cause your love I want And your love I ever needed And your love Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. They'll come and give them a hand as they come. And you're all I ever needed. Cause you're all I want. They're still coming. Give them a hand as they come. Come on. How me know you are near. God good. Well, thank God you guys have come. Let me just chat with you for a moment. I want you to look to your left. See this guy waving at you over here? His name is Pastor Dave. Wave real big, Pastor Dave. And then guess what? Pastor Dave is a really good guy. No strange, weird stuff goes on. You know how you go to church, you think maybe they're weird? I'm weird. You got past me. Dave's cool. Is that okay? He's going to do three things. Let me tell you what he's going to do. Number one, going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You need to invite Jesus into your heart. He does not come in because you need him. He went to the cross for you because you need him. Now he's a gentleman and you need to invite him in. Number two, listen to this. After you're saved, now that you have a relationship with Jesus, now that you're born again, listen to this. What do you do next? He'll give you some free information that you can take home and read about what to do next. Number three, you said you're going to give God all your heart. You said you're going to give God all your life. We want to help you to do that. He'll introduce you to a program that we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Friend. That's all they are, friends. You meet them before church service. They go through some scripture with you. They encourage you. You need someone to pray for you during the week because your old friends won't pray for, pray for you. But guess what? Your new friend will. And that's what this is all about. So hook up with a spiritual personal trainer and you're going to get blessed. Everybody make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.